turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 5 this morning. As you are turning there, I'm going to read from it. Follow along with me, if you will. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and to doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth for every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, verse five, for it is sanctified by the word of God and in prayer. With that said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word. We look forward to just hearing what your spirit has to say and what a heavy section of scripture, but how evident it is, especially in our time right now. And Lord, as we're praying and thinking and about to study this word, I pray for those in here who are ridden with guilt of legalism that don't understand grace in its fullest, that in this moment, we would understand it in such a profound way that we would leave knowing that your grace is so powerful and your love and the message of the cross and your resurrection. Speak through your servant this morning, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. This passage of scripture is known by most people as the great apostasy. A lot of you may have different translations in your Bible, uh, but the Bible actually of these different translations have different titles. The King James calls it the falling away. The NIV and the ESV call it the rebellion, which for whatever reason has a very Star Wars feel to me. Just what is this rebellion exactly? Well, basically the rebellion, it carries the idea of someone who, follow me, abandons the truth. The Bible describes that there's going to be a time, more specifically during the end times, where there's going to be a mass rejection of people who basically uh, abandon and reject God's revelation. A further falling away of an already fallen world, if you will. And it's going to take place, it's going to take form in in this, this apparent rebellion by men and women who are completely abandoning the scriptures altogether. You see, at this point in our study through 1 Timothy, you've been noticing that Paul has been explaining and addressing to Timothy uh, his intention on leaders, what church leadership should look like, the qualifications of a bishop, of a deacon, and so forth. But in this section of scripture, in, in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, he redirects the focus on the dangers of men and women who are departing from the faith, who are listening to deceiving spirits, and these spirits are basically promoting a demonic doctrine. And it's because of this promotion of this demonic doctrine, their influence so heavily on, we're gonna find out their, their conscience has been seared. False teachers love to forbid what the Bible allows, but they allow to practice what the Bible forbids. And there's things that we're gonna notice as we study this, what should cause us to say, that's a red flag or that person is solid. And that's the nice thing about why we do what we do here, that we study through the scriptures, we expositionally dissect it so that we can understand it. But these false teachers, guys, a lot of it, their, their doctrine is rooted in demonic legalism. And I use those strong words for a reason because I do believe strongly that if God's word proclaims it, then we need to highlight it. And if God's word does not proclaim it and you're promoting it, then there's a problem. I'm looking at some of you. It's like, I'm sure a lot of you are really glad you came to church this morning. What did John teach on demonic influence? Last week in the green room, dad's looking at me and he's like, I get to teach on grace and the gospel. You get to teach on the great apostasy next week. (laughs) Have fun with that. 
This is what we talk about in private. It's great. <laughs> a lot to talk about. So let's, let's start. Verse 1 of 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Interestingly enough, this is the only portion in all of the pastoral epistles, listen carefully, where basically demons are mentioned. Now let this bake your noodle for a second. Just as the Bible describes there are mysteries of godliness concerning Jesus Christ, and you learned about that with my dad in 1 Timothy 3.16, in the same way, there's a mystery of iniquity that surrounds the work of Satan and everything he has to do. And you can read about that in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. So yes, there are agents for Christ, but there are also agents for Satan. Here at the church, we have numerous uh, people that are, that are on staff, whether they're pastors, ministry workers, Christians, those in here who are hearing my voice, you volunteer your time, your money to invest in something that will last into eternity. You are here because you want to promote Jesus. And that's what we're always going to do. We promote Jesus for the sake of seeing lost souls found. If we were a gang, we would be the Crips for Christ. That's who we would be. <laughs> and for most of you, it's like, yeah, my intention as a Christian is to bring glory to God through the way that I give, through the way that I serve, and all of this. But for some of you, this might sound so absurd, but it's incredibly imperative that you understand that it's biblical. It is absurd to consider that Satan also has ministers and doctrines that seek to deceive God's people and to lead them astray. And he has an eternal perspective too. His, his intention is just the same as ours in that he wants to lead people astray because as I told you weeks ago, it's hard for someone to be on the losing side. And for Satan, he's on the losing side. We worship God and declare things like, God, you have conquered the grave. And Satan knows that. And Satan fights dirty. All sore losers do. But this is his intention. I told you a couple weeks ago that the, the bishop's responsibility is to love the sheep. And I told you sometimes sheep bite back. They bite the shepherd. <laughs> but you know what's interesting too is the Bible describes there are individuals that are described as wolves who dress up as sheep. And there are things that we as Christians ought to look for to help us understand who these people are. Jesus spoke about it. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. Again, the, a wolf's main objective is to seek and to deceive God's people, lead them astray and destroy them. Now, according to Paul here, back in 1 Timothy chapter 4, the warning from the Holy Spirit is that in latter times, some are going to depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So this is the reality of verse 1. Paul's not just giving us a passive suggestion, but rather a prophetic prediction. The Spirit, look what it says. Look at the severity and the tone of the warning. The Spirit expressly says. Another translation is the Spirit explicitly says, which should cause us to say, this is a warning. And I know a lot of us in here are really good at disregarding warnings in general, like warning labels, like, hmm, do not hold wrong end of chainsaw. It's probably just a suggestion. That is a literal warning that exists today. Again, I get we can disregard warning labels and whatnot, but, th but this is something, guys, we cannot ignore because the Spirit explicitly is trying to get our attention in the warning of what to look out for. And Paul, he knows that, that there are going to be dangers that really are going to rise up, as he puts it, in latter times. To which some of us might ask the question, well, what are some indications that we're living in, in latter times? Or, or, or more specifically, the real question we should be asking ourselves, what is latter times? 
These are the days prior to the second coming of Jesus, meaning the latter times began, listen guys, at the resurrection of Jesus, and it's continuing until his second coming, which should cause us to say, okay, Jesus' second coming has not happened, so then that does mean right now we are living in the latter times. Think about this in relation with a woman who is pregnant. Just as a woman who's holding life in her body at the moment of conception, there's this nine month period that she knows is gonna come to a place where the baby is gonna come. Baby's coming one way or another. And as the woman draws closer towards the pregnancy in that she's gonna deliver this baby, there are signs, there are indications. There are things the doctor is gonna tell you explicitly what you should look for when you're gonna have the baby any moment, where for some of you ladies, it might be one of those, okay, so every three to four minutes, um, I'm having contractions that are lasting 30 to 45 seconds. Um, that's probably not important, right? You know, th th those are the warning labels that you need to go. In fact, I remember when Carolyn was pregnant with our second one, you know, cause I get, you base everything off your first kid and then you try to gauge it for the second one. We were playing cards at my house and I'm looking at her like, we have to go to the hospital. She's like, no, we're gonna get there and it's not gonna be ready because that's what happened with Jaden the first time. And then of course we wait, we wait and we get there and they're like, oh, by the way, you're six centimeters dilated. Like, thank God you came when you did. There's indicators that we have to explicitly help us understand what we need to look for. And so I would say that we're living, guys, we're living in the latter days and there are indicators, even right now, that Jesus is coming sooner rather than later. And how can I know that for sure? According to verse 1, the indicators are that men and women are going to depart from the faith. They're going to give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Those who depart the faith means that they are going to abandon biblical truth and biblical principles. And why are they gonna do that? What's the point of that? According to Paul, it's because they've been deceived by agents of Satan, that they completely embrace a doctrine that is demonic. And I'm, and I'm looking at your faces and, I'm, I, and, and I would imagine you're thinking in your head, I feel like that's a lot today. And I'm hoping you're gonna realize after this Bible study that these warnings aren't to force us to feel paranoid because we should not negate the great commission Jesus has still given us today. But we do need to look at these warnings seriously because the reality is Satan and his tactics are to use men and women, listen carefully, in the church. If he can attack within the church, then he's got it. And again, that might sound like a shock to some of you. Satan using professed Christians, I emphasize the word professed, and they use these professed Christians within the church to accomplish his work, you better believe that's true. I mean, think about it even scripturally. Satan attempted to use Peter. Remember, Jesus is going to the cross and Jesus expresses that to, to Peter and Peter's like, far be from it, Lord. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. You know, he, he attempts to use men in, in the Bible and he attempts to use men and women today. We see, saw it with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, when they lied to the church, when they lied to God about what they gave. Satan used Judas to, to betray Jesus in Luke 22. Uh, Satan lied to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And Paul warns us in the book of Acts that false teachers are going to come within the church. I couldn't help, again, to think of Charles Spurgeon. He once said this concerning this topic. Listen to this, guys. A time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. <laughs> and you know what that makes me realize explicitly in my own heart of hearts? We, we have to study the word here. We have to study the word so that we understand why we believe in what we believe. So we can go to Peter where it says, always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that is inside of you. You wanna know how I know we're living in the latter times? Just look around. Just look around at what a lot of churches are presenting. You can spot a fake 
away. You can spot a fake from a mile away if you know the scriptures. You know what I love to watch? The antique road show. I love watching it because there's always that one person who's like, yeah, there was this in my house. What is it? And the guy's like, wow, this is the most valuable artifact in the world. It's worth millions. And they're like, I had no idea. And then it goes like to the next person. You know, you get those people that are like, wow. But then you get those guys that's like, my great uncle Earl gave this to me and said it is the greatest artifact next to Indiana Jones. And then they're like, okay. And they look at it and they're like, this is a fake. You can see underneath it says made in China. <laughs> And part of you feels so bad for him, but then a part of you is so thankful that there are those who can authenticate whether something is real or, or a fake. That's why for any of you that have coins of any kind, bring it to my dad. He will be so giddy if you bring him a coin, but don't be offended when he looks at the coin, the knife, the artifact that you have, and he looks at it, and then he's like, it's garbage, it's not real. Or he'll hustle you and he'll be like, I mean, it's sort of real. I'll give you 10 bucks for it. <laughs> he wouldn't do that. In the same way, guys, we need, as Christians, it shouldn't just be contingent on the, the, the lead bishop to spot out the fakes. We need to be able to spot the fakes. We need to be able to distinguish this person promotes Jesus and this person is promoting what sounds like Jesus but is not Jesus. And in relation to the context of our passage, I think the reality every person in here needs to face is that false teachers have not decreased since Paul has written this letter, but have increased rapidly. Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons have been a problem since Adam and Eve first walked in the garden. That is why as a church, we are never going to abandon the scriptures, the expositional teaching of God's word, because it's the scriptures that are going to warn us what to look for concerning threats in the church. With that said, we need to be biblical, not legalistic. Did you catch that? We need to be biblically centered, not legally driven. We need the scriptures, guys, we need the scriptures to guide our life, not our personal emotion and beliefs, because that's where we get into trouble. Because more often than not, you're gonna find men and women in the church fighting over things that are so non-essential, that are so not valuable for eternity. And some of the harshest things that I have heard have been, been from people in the church that hold positions that have no biblical merit, but they're so convinced that they need to enforce it onto you that they belittle you and make you feel this small. Charles Swindoll once put it this way, one cannot accidentally become an apostate, nor can one be guilty of apostasy over non-essential doctrines and issues that the scriptures do not definitively address. And he's exactly right. For example, if one of you writes a letter or a note in the agape box and say, John, you need to make it a policy that those who serve at the church on staff cannot have holes in their jeans, you're laughing, but it's happened. <laughs> we are going to leave the church until something changes. I'm not going to look at them and say things like apostasy, demon get behind me, Satan with those deceiving ploys of holy jeans. I have to make this funny because the reality is there are so many guys, we get more complaints than we get compliments and I get it comes with the turf, but here's, here's me being transparent with you right now as a pastor. I am more concerned about promoting the gospel and promoting things that are going to win souls, not convince people to change their holy genes. You have to know that we as a church are going to make it our focus entirely to promote the essential things that Jesus is the only name under heaven by which we can call upon who can save us because he is the only one that has satisfied the issue of sin that the wrath of God came upon him. He died for you. He died for me in that while we were still yet sinners. And he will go and he went to the cross knowing you're going to still sin for him, sin against him. And he's going to rise from the dead three days later, conquering death so we can sing worship songs that declare that truth. At the end of the day, as a church, the essentials are this. Jesus is the only one that can save us of our sins. And the word of God is inspired 
that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We are going to promote Jesus and Jesus alone because he is the only essential thing that we can put our focus on. Guys, we need to be passionate about preserving the gospel because we have too many people in our culture that are changing it. We need to be passionate about not changing the gospel message because people are offended when the reality is it's rooted in legalism. We have to stop being legalistic over things that have zero eternal value and embrace the person that has been lost. I want to look for the lost souls, guys. God's called us to be fisher of men, right? Again, we catch the fish, God cleans the fish. Stop trying to change the lifestyle and the way people are. Let God do what he does best. Amen? Okay, okay. Lord, break our heart for what breaks yours. So again, if you have holes in your jeans, you're not an apostate. Thus saith the Lord. All right. <laughs> Guys, an apostate is someone who convinces men and women to depart from the faith and then basically to allow these women to, and men to be influenced by doctrines of demons. And apostates, their goal is to seduce men and women to abandon the faith. You don't need to read the scriptures to give insight to why you should believe in what you believe. And one of the ways that they try to seduce men and women to do this is that very thing. You don't need the, you don't need the Bible, it's archaic. Why would you need the Bible to help you make a decision? Like, I get that there are cults that are obvious to have these apostates leadership, but not all apostates are in cults. Some of them are in churches at pulpits. Guys, I'm, I'm confident that I can share these things with you because I'm, you, you're taught the, the scripture here. And you're taught God's word, and you can search the scriptures yourself. And I'm not saying you guys need to leave here like, maybe John's an apostate. Maybe he's, maybe, I've never thought of it that way, but John put it that, you know what? Study the scriptures, because if you ever hear anything that's against what the Bible teaches, oh boy, call the person out. Please, call the person out. But that's exactly why we can't abandon sound doctrine we have to study God's word. And not only that, Paul goes into further detail of what is happening to these men and women who are taking heed to these doctrines of Satan. Look at verse 2 now of 1 Timothy 4. It says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Remember how I just told, I quoted from Matthew chapter 7, the, the passage on the wolf in sheep's clothing? Jesus said the way that we're going to know that they're wolves in sheep's clothing is you will know them by their fruit. And Paul, he said back here in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that these false teachers are going to speak lies and hypocrisy. So a false teacher is going to promote something, right? He's going to preach one thing, but he's going to practice something different. With that said, is it possible for a Christian to be a hypocrite, but not a false teacher. Follow me for a second. Christians, when we sin against the Lord, whether we're being hypocritical or not, because that's the big issue in the church, you're a hypocrite. As a Christian, if I, John Dracy, if I'm being a hypocrite, I have the Holy Spirit to convict me and I can look to the scripture and say, search and know my heart, Lord, find any fault within me. So that when the spirit does convict me, the end result is this. I can either repent and ask for forgiveness or I can completely disregard it. Christians, if you're being hypocritical, you have the spirit inside of you. Don't ignore it. Whereas the false teacher, his hypocrisy is what drives his message. That's why at the end it says they have their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The false teacher has no conviction because the, whole, the false teacher doesn't have the Holy Spirit. Their conscience, which at one time probably could have convicted them at the thought of abandoning the truth of the word was a bad idea. They don't reply at all. And thus the result, according to Paul, is their conscience is seared with a hot iron. We get the word cauterized from that word seared here. He was referring to an ancient practice of branding the criminal. 
Because it was. Back then, it was common for you to brand a, a criminal on the forehead with a mark that distinguished that this person is, in fact, a criminal. Obviously, here in 1 Timothy 4, Paul wasn't referring to uh, their forehead. He was referring to something else being branded instead, their conscience. And their conscience, because it was branded by this influence of demonic doctrines, is going to leave, as I told you, a mark, if you will. It's going to indicate that that you're going to know them by their fruit, but something's going to stand out. A scar, if you will, a metaphorical scar. Now, in the mid-90s, my brother Anthony had his appendix removed. And he actually almost died. His appendix actually burst, and he almost died. Now, some of you are like, where is he going to go with this that, about death? It's not about death. It's about his scar he got. Follow me. Follow me. Nowadays, if someone has appendicitis because of the advancement of surgical removal of the, the appendix, it leaves like no scar. It's insane what is possible right now. But for my brother Anthony, his scar from his surgery looks like it was like, it looks like the surgery was done on Colfax in the middle of the night, right? <laughs> Anthony, my brother, has a scar that goes all the way up and then like over to the side. Now, because my brother Anthony has a very dark sense of humor, Whenever we would go swimming, he would lie to people as to why he had the scar. Like all the time. And it wasn't just like one particular thing. He would say all these different things. Like he would say something like, well, it was a scar from my conjoined Siamese twin. (laughs) Or I was bit by a shark. Like he once convinced a person that he put Pop Rocks in a soda, drank it, and it blew his stomach up. And here's the sad reality, like, people believed Anthony. Like, he legitimately brought a story that was like, wow, that's really sad. And I told Anthony, I was like, Anthony, because of your joking, sarcastic qualities, actually, you'd be a really good cult leader. But anyways, anyways. (laughs) A false teacher, guys, a false teacher, in a way, not only sear their conscience, but they are left with a distinguished scar that we would interpret as they're gonna have a fruit that's demonstrated that that person is not demonstrating qualities of godliness. Whereas they're gonna be completely different from the Christian minister who loves Jesus and serves Jesus, and that's why the Bible says, show fruit worthy of repentance. Warren Wearsby put it this way. Whenever we affirm with our lips something that we deny with our lives, whether people know it or not, we deaden our conscience just a little bit more. The issue that we're discussing right here, guys, are biblical morals being thrown completely out the window. Because people think that morals and emotions should dictate your doctrine, but the reality is that way of thinking is what gets people in trouble. That the way I feel and the way I think, that's what determines what's right and wrong. And we can't let our feelings determine our convictions, guys. Listen to this, Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick, the ESV version says. Proverbs 28, 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. And you hear that, and for some of you, it's like, okay, so then if you're telling me I'm not supposed to listen to my heart, listen to my feelings, then how do I know if I'm making the right decision? Guys, our feelings are unstable. They are. As strong as you might think you are, as humans, we have tendencies to lie, to take back what we said, to change our minds. So what is the solution? The solution is that we have to put our faith in Jesus even when our emotions are telling us otherwise. Every single time. Psalm 73, 26. Listen to this, guys. My flesh and my heart fails. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. When we trust in our emotions, knowledge, and our heart, we are, in a way, we're resisting We're resisting the spirit. But when we allow God's strength, when you allow God's strength to renew you, 
to determine why you should believe in what you believe, then you make decisions that are going to honor God. And even when you do make bad decisions, guys, and you thought you were making a decision that was honoring God, praise God for grace. We don't sin so that grace can abound. But the reality is we are going to make mistakes. But that's exactly why we need to continue to look to Jesus. A lot of false teachers, guys, they justify their position solely because, as Paul puts it here, they have seared their conscience. So now, Paul lists the false teachers' positions that had zero biblical support to them. I love this about Paul. Look what he said in verse 3. Forbidding to marry and, com and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You see, the false teacher, he's not content with just simply imposing a false teaching. He wants his listeners to have a false way of living. And here, in this case, it was to forbid them from getting married and abstaining from certain food. And what we're reading here are examples of men and women who have departed from the faith and developed, listen guys, listen carefully. They have developed legalistic positions. I once knew a guy who was a little older than me, about a year older than me, in early 2000s that held this position that no one should ever get married. And it was one of those things where it's like, okay, but then he started to really extend on it. That he, in his mind, he said, well, Paul the Apostle, who during the time of his Christian ministry was not married, and the Paul the Apostle was way more effective minister. And I'm listening to this guy, and you know, he was right in that Paul probably historically was not married during his uh, time as a Christian. And he could, yes, at, have the freedom and flexibility to, at the drop of a dime, go wherever God is calling him. I get that. I accept that. But the guy that I was talking to was wrong because he was imposing a legalistic position to the point where as we're talking to him, he somehow was explaining to us, and because I'm holding this position, I'm more spiritual and I'm more in favor in God's eyes. And it was like, whoa. First of all, that's not biblical. And can I just say something? I am what I am because of my wife. I give my life to the Lord because of Carolyn. I can't do what I do without my wife. And I get that there are men and women in here who have, are not married or you've never been married. And you know what? God bless you because that's okay too. The issue that we're facing right here is that this guy that I spoke with thought he was more favored and, and spiritual than, than everyone else. And he was wrong. Guys, God instituted marriage. God not only instituted marriage, the false teachers seem to ignore the fact that marriage is a gift from God, established by God, defined by God between one man and one woman for life. The key factor for a false teacher, again, is they love to forbid what the Bible allows, but they love to promote what the Bible forbids. And those are the things that should cause you to say, this is a red flag. And that's the point, guys. Legalism enforces convictions that have no biblical merit. Did you hear that? Legalism is enforcing your convictions that have zero biblical support. See, legalism promotes this false idea that, well, until, until you embrace whatever legalistic position that I'm holding, you are somehow less spiritual than me, or you are, I'm more favored in God's eyes than you. And I can't even begin to tell you how many times I've seen this in the church. And I've come to realize, guys, and here's now me talking to everyone in the room. I've come to realize that in the church, the ones that hold those legalistic positions are typically the ones that misunderstand the power and true saving grace. Something happens when you look at your life and you realize you are completely undeserving of Jesus' love towards you. When you come to a point where you open the scriptures and it's like, who am I, Lord, that you speak to me through your word? Who am I, Lord, that you would call me a child? And you look at your life thinking, I don't know, I don't know, I'm just being honest with you guys. When I look at grace in its fullest, God's righteousness demands that my sin had to be dealt with, and he dealt with it at the cross. 
And when I come to this realization that his grace truly is enough and there's nothing I can do that can change his love for me, whether I wear jeans without holes in them or whether I sing the loudest during worship or whether I, whatever, and we, we put these standards on ourselves that God loves me more because I do this, 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 and this. A lot of these people hold these positions thinking it's gonna draw them closer to God, but it's not doing that. Guys, in the early church, in the early centuries of the church, there were monks who were basically held these positions like, I'm going to go to the desolate deserts of, of the earth, and I'm going to just show how spiritual I am by going there all by myself. And in a way, they, they were torturing themselves. They would hold these positions like, well, I'm not, I'm not going to cook meat. I'm going to eat raw meat. That's totally fine if it's sushi. But anyways... Or they would hold these positions like, I'm going to stand all night and I'm going to stand against something that's going to keep me awake and attentive uh, because I'm going to make it impossible for me to sleep. Or they would neglect their body and not wash it and like dead, like insects would fall from their bodies. And like, here's where it gets crazy because I'm saying this to you, like, there's no way. This is where it's crazy. A lot of these monks held these positions and embraced this way of living because they thought they were more in favor in God's eyes and more spiritual than others because they were doing it. As if God's going to be impressed by sushi, sushi eating insomniac hippies. I don't know. I just, I'm looking at, and I'm just thinking like, what, is, what a hard life. And maybe some of you aren't living with extremes like that. But maybe for some of you, the, the reality is you've adopted that way of thinking. Because again, we think that if we sacrifice something for God, whether it's in the context here of 1 Timothy 4, to not marry and to not eat certain food or whatever it might be, then somehow Jesus owes me something. We do. If I do this for Jesus, or if I sacrifice my time for Jesus, then, then, he, then I need extra favor, extra love, or extra whatever. Guys, that's legalism at its worst. When you try to manipulate God to get something in return. And if you operate that way, you're going to find yourself to be a very frustrated and angry person. Because you're realizing that your service to God, if it's not solely because I am undeserving of his love and grace and my life belongs to him through the good, bad, and ugly. And whatever comes my way, Lord, I, I'm gonna worship you. If it's not that way and it's Lord, well, I'm gonna worship you contingent on this, this, and this. You're gonna be frustrated. God is not indebted to us. And in this case, according to verse three, the doctrines that were being enforced, forbidding them to get married, commanding to abstain from certain foods. And I love this part, look at the end of verse three which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Can you imagine if Paul the Apostle was writing this letter today in 2019? I'm just imagining him writing to Timothy, and he's like, listen, Timothy, you, you tell the church at Ephesus that shopping at King Supers doesn't make them less spiritual if they don't shop at Whole Foods. And like, Timothy's like, thank God, because I can't afford Whole Foods. This is such good news. Like, I get there are some of you in here who have made the decision in your heart to basically abstain from eating certain foods from certain establishments and to purchase certain things from certain companies. And can I just say something? I commend you for that. If God is convicting you to boycott something, the Lord be with you as you do that. It's totally understandable. But one of the things that Paul the Apostle that he's advocating certain foods for the Christians in Ephesus that they didn't have to abstain from it is because he said God created it to be received. Not only did he create it to be received, to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So here's what he's saying to the church at Ephesus because he talks about this issue to the church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica, the church at Ephesus, the issue of food. Food was a huge subject for Paul for a lot of these guys. But here's what he's telling them now, here. If God made it, then enjoy it. Then enjoy it. The Bible says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Yes and amen, said everyone in the house that eats at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> the Bible also says all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. Just because you have the freedom and liberty to eat whatever doesn't necessarily mean it's wise to eat whatever and anything. If you don't believe that's true, you should like 
watch the show Man vs. Wild. <laughs> like, that guy literally eats anything and everything. But the reality is, God didn't give us the temples that we have so that we can just misuse it and say, in the name of Jesus, I have liberties to eat whatever I want. Because the food that you have liberty to eat can also be the food that is an addiction. Something to think about. Something to think about. So why is it okay to eat certain foods? Look at verses 4 and 5 of 1 Timothy. For every creature of God is good, except dogs and cats. Don't eat dogs and cats, by the way. See what I just did there? I'm testing you. I just added to the scriptures. No, it says, for every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. And again, I know everyone's honing in on that verse. For every creature of God is good. We can eat whatever. We can eat all things. And again, my daughter came up to me in the backyard. She's like, Dad, what would you do if I ate this worm? And I'm like, what is prompting her to do that? She was watching Man vs. Wild. She was, and I'm just like, and she's like, he said it has protein. And I'm just thinking like, in a life or death situation, I've decided that I'm just going to die and be before Jesus than to eat some of the things he promotes because I'm often trapped in the Sahara Desert. I'm just saying. Again, just because you can eat anything because it is good, according to what we just read right here, doesn't necessarily mean we should eat everything because it isn't good for your health. Every creature of God is good, it says, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. I want you guys to really listen to what I'm about to say. We are not limited by any kind of diet. What we eat does not make you more righteous before God, although what you eat can speed up the process for you to stand before God. <laughs> but I also want you to notice that it says it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So now here's this thing that we should talk about. There, we, it makes me think of prayer before a meal. Have you ever wondered that? Why do we pray before a meal? I think one of the main reasons is we pray before a meal to thank God in prayer, but I want you to notice that the emphasis is not on asking God to bless the food, but rather thanking God for providing the food. Every creature of God is good, nothing is to be refused, and it's to be received with, look, thanksgiving. That's why I always thought it's funny that when we ask God to bless certain meals that we're about to eat that are so clearly unhealthy and bad for us, you know, Lord, bless this greasy bacon sandwich that I'm about to eat and dip the remaining bacon grease sauce as, as a satisfaction to my lips. Like, I get it. But the reality is praying to God to bless certain food that's obviously bad is like asking God to bless the pack of cigarettes you're about to smoke. Lord, bless this cigarette I'm about to smoke that it doesn't give me cancer. Obvi what I'm trying to give you an idea of is that there are, yes, you have liberties, guys. But the reality is the choices you make, like I said, have consequences. And at the time that Paul was writing this letter, one of the dominant false teachings that invaded the church at Ephesus was Gnosticism. And the Gnostics were basically promoting this thing that they believed that the spirit was good, that matter was evil, that everything in the world, all physical material substances are therefore tainted, they're corrupted by evil because they are physical material. That's why they gave this false doctrine that Jesus couldn't have been Lord because Jesus was physical material. If Jesus was Lord, then he would be a phantom. He wouldn't be physical material. And so now you've got this issue in the church at Ephesus where it's like, maybe that's true. And Paul's like, that's not true. Well, a lot of the Gnostics at this time were promoting this idea of denying the body as much as possible. And by doing so, it promoted a heightened spirituality, if you will. And what we're seeing here, the two things being denied at the church at Ephesus, most likely by these Gnostics, meat and marriage, which are like my two favorite things in the world, and coffee, of course. But the Gnostics, they promoted this idea that a vegetarian diet or a celibate life are the best ways to, de to deny the flesh and promote a lifestyle of this super spiritual awesomeness. And that's not the case. Again, let's go back to this. Maybe some of you are vegetarians and maybe some of you are not married. That is totally fine. 
The issue becomes, it becomes an issue if you start enforcing that on other people that you are more loved and more in favor in God's eyes because you've chosen to practice that. And that is not biblical. And that's why Paul was trying to address this issue. Last thing I want to point out in verse 5 is it says, for it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. I want you guys to think about this. The word of God sanctifies food in the sense that God gave us general commands. We learned about it in our Genesis study, Genesis 129, remember that? It says, God said, I have given you every herb and that yields seed, which is of the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you, it shall be for food. Genesis 9, 3, for every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. God's given it to you, so enjoy it. And again, I love this idea that we pray before meals, and you should, guys. If you pray before meals, pray before you go to bed. Pray for someone as they're just walking past. You know, we say things like that. Remember to pray for me. Stop what you're doing and just pray for them on the spot. But if you are praying before meals in a ritualistic, superstitious way, then that's a problem. So then how should we as Christians respond to 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5? Is Paul advocating that we wage war against health and diet? That's Netflix's job with their spreading food documentary propaganda. Is that just me? Have you ever watched Netflix and it's like every other documentary is like, everything we eat is going to kill us. It's like, it's probably true. But still, that's not what Paul's advocating right here. We need to be passionate at preserving the gospel that Satan is influencing men and women to change and alter. We need to stop being legalistic over things that guys have zero eternal value. And we need to start embracing a Jesus that wants the individual saved. He wants to see the soul restored to him. And these are the final thoughts. Let God's word direct your life. Let God's word be the final say so. Because people think we're, we're living in a, in a time where our morals and our emotions are the very thing that dictate our doctrine. And I'm here to tell you, if you think like that, it's going to get you in trouble. We can't let our feelings determine our convictions. It's in Jesus and Jesus alone through his word that we can understand the meaning of life, of grace, and his love towards us. Because you know what happens at the end of the day? Because I'm about to pray. Wouldn't it be great if people came to our church and came into your home and came into contact with you and the first thing they thought was that person loves Jesus so much that I want to know about Jesus. Not that person is so legalistic, I want to stay as far away as possible from them. We want to promote Jesus and Jesus alone here. Amen? Let's come before the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the only one by which we can call upon to save us that Jesus you took on the cross that day to Golgotha. You took on the weight of my sin and every person hearing my voice right now. And maybe there are those in here who have lived their life in such a heavy legalistic way that they have to do this, this, and this to earn favor from you. And Lord, at the end of the day, there's nothing we can do to change your love for us. Lord, I pray we would show fruit worthy of repentance, that we would live our life that whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we bring glory to you. And so with that said, because you sanctified marriage, Lord, I pray for the marriages in this room. I pray you would not only bless them, I pray that over their communication to one another. I pray over the preservation of their sexuality with one another. I pray that Satan who has perverted the issues of marriage would not take root in the way we think about it. And Lord, I thank you that you gave us food to eat, to replenish the body, and I pray for wisdom that we would eat things that are not going to promote a faster death. Give us wisdom, Lord, on everything we do, even though we have liberties to eat whatever we want. And Lord, for those in here who don't know you, and for those who are praying with me with your heads bowed, if you've never given your life to Jesus, and hearing this for the first time has been eye-opening, and you want to give your life to Jesus right now in this moment, that you have decided, I want to serve Jesus because he died for me and he rose from the grave. 
and repeat after me. Jesus, I believe you are God. I believe you died for my sins and I believe you rose from the grave. I give you my life because you gave up your life for me. Use me, Lord. My life now belongs to you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand, let's worship.